Welcome to the Doctor's Kitchen with me, Dr. Rupi, where we interview some of the most interesting people in the world of health and wellness. And I have my good, good friend, Drew Prohit here from LA. Great to be here, Rupi. Man, I'm super excited to get into this podcast with you. We met uh, a couple of years ago now and um, connected instantly. And you know, you've been instrumental in the health and wellness industry over in LA. Um, and also, you have this new passion project of yours, which is all about community, friendship, connection, which we're definitely going to get into, right? Absolutely. We're going to talk about it all. I'm a huge fan of the Doctor's uh, Kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to be here in the new studio setup. It looks beautiful. Yeah. And it looks delicious. We're going to be doing a Cajun-style sweet corn and purple sprout and broccoli uh, meal with a pea and avocado dressing uh, dressed with some lobster. Does that sound good? Sounds great. How do you generally eat in, in LA? Like, you know, I can, you're a health and wellness guru, so I'm assuming that you eat pretty well, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, my journey started actually because I had really, really bad acne uh -huh. in high school mm -hmm. and you know there's a lot of different thoughts that are out there my dear friend uh, Anahat O'Connor from the New York Times actually has a really great article that he wrote talking about all the latest science on skin mm -hmm. and what we know about skin and acne and how there are starting to be some strong connections in there in my case I didn't know that the food that I was eating was sort of influencing my skin yeah. until I went to a lecture one day and a woman that was there said, oh, sometimes people have an inflammatory response to dairy, especially if they're South Asian, black, Asian. Mm -hmm. So just try something on your own. Mm -hmm. Just try going off of dairy and processed sugar for a little while. See if your skin improves. What do you have to lose, mm -hmm. if anything? So this was when I was 18 years old. It was the year 2000. It was the summer of going from high school to college. And I came back home after visiting this event. And I told my parents, I'm not eating any dairy. And growing up as a vegetarian <laughs> Indian, they thought it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. But I cut out dairy from my diet, and lo and behold, in about two, uh, two and a half months, my skin completely cleared up. Oh, wow. So that's when I first made the connection for myself that food impacted not only how I felt, but how I looked as well, too. And nothing is a greater motivator for a teenager like Vanity. <laughs> <laughs> so fast forward to today, uh, still largely dairy-free. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know my kind of food uh, issues of certain foods I don't do as well with. I don't have a lot of gluten in my diet. I just yeah. feel better. Mm -hmm. I don't have celiac, mm -hmm. but uh, I have a little bit of sensitivity that I notice. But mostly how you teach, brother, it's uh, whole foods, um, minimizing the total amount of meat consumption that's there. I still do eat a little bit of meat, and it's focused a lot on seafood. Yeah. And... Um, tons of fresh vegetables, tons of color mm -hmm. in the diet. I try to get that rainbow yeah. <laughs> in well, what I uh, make on a, a daily basis. Hopefully we're getting some of those colors in today. Yeah, so I see that. Just to start off the recipe, what I've done, um, we've got some beautiful sweet corn here that was grown in the UK. We actually have like tons Delicious. of that grown here. Beautiful, really, really good ingredients, especially this time of year. Got some purple sprout and broccoli. This is grown in Lincolnshire, um, uh, not too far from London actually. We've got some um, spinach that I've just roughly chopped, uh, some frozen peas, got some pine nuts, which are a delicious ingredient, good, good as good quality favorite. bats and stuff. Some lobster now, to sound a bit fancy, uh, <laughs> if you don't have lobster at home, you could use things like uh, cooked prawns or even crayfish, or if you wanted to make it completely vegetarian, white beans, absolutely fine, just drained and rinsed. Um, all I've done with this is just uh, cook them in the shells and then I've uh, let it cool and then taking the shells off, it just makes it a lot easier. And then we're gonna reheat that in the pan. And then, like I said, some um, some cooked potatoes here. Uh, but again, if you didn't have cooked potatoes, you could use some drained beans. Um, I like to cook my beans from scratch. I find that the texture and everything is great. But as a convenience, sometimes you get the Tetra Packs, yeah. um, which are like a really good packaging. It's uh, more sustainable um, and it's just fresher as well. And when you're cooking your beans, do you, uh, how do you how do you prepare them? How do you put them together? I soak them. Yeah. So uh, something that my mum taught me when I was a kid yeah. um, was always soak lentils, dal, yeah. um, beans, all that kind of stuff. Make sure uh, that that's done like overnight, and then they've taken up a lot of that water. Remove the water, put it back in the pan, and then cook it low and slow for a long period of time. That actually reduces the anti nutrients, the lectins, and that yeah. kind of stuff. And actually, it gives some benefits as well in those small amounts. So, that's great. to start off this recipe, what we're going to do is um, sweet corn uh, that's raw here is going to go straight into the pan. Mm -hmm. This is on low to medium heat. Every time I cook, it's low to medium heat because I like to cook with olive oil and you don't want to destroy those polyphenols. Um, so, that goes in here. You'll hear a little sizzle. 
and um, some of the pine nuts as well. And that's going to give like a nice little char on the outside, a little bit of colour. And then we'll take that out of the pan and then start off with the, the rest of the stuff. So, um, so your journey, like you didn't, you didn't grow up in LA, right? Didn't grow up in LA. <laughs> Where'd you start? Was born in Nairobi. Yeah. Uh, family comes from an Indian background. We ended up in Nairobi. We're fourth generation from Nairobi. Uh -huh. I was also born in Nairobi. Right around that time, things started getting a little dicey. I was born on the day of the coup, right. coup attempt in Nairobi. And my dad thought, okay, maybe it's time to explore. Half my family came out here to England. Mm -hmm. and another half of my family ended up in, uh, in the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, primarily grew up on the East Coast uh, in a little state called Delaware. Delaware, yeah. yeah. And so, so how old were you when you, when you left? Uh, when, we, when I left Kenya, I don't really have any memories of Kenya. I was uh, barely three years old. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool, yeah. yeah. And so most of what you know growing up has been American. and has been America, and uh, one of the things I got good at very quickly is, you know, kind of typical immigrant family, at least in the, the US, I don't know how it is out here. Uh, my parents moved a lot, because every time my dad got a new opportunity, mm. he's in this field of healthcare, mm. on the administration, administrative side, he'd say, okay, great, it's time to get up and move, and yeah. we'd move to the next uh, city. Yeah. And, uh, and so immigrant parent mentality, we were in one city, you'd be there for a while, you'd get settled, you'd go to a new city, you have to learn how to make friends very quickly yeah. moving from town to town to town. Yeah, so is that something that you think that you may have grown up um, with the ability to do, to, to make friends very quickly? Absolutely. Or? You know, they say one of the best teachers is empathy. Mm. And I had so much, I have so much empathy for new people that move into town, into my city. I have so much empathy for people that are just getting started off mm. in a new venture career where they don't know a lot of people mm. because I've been that kid who was the new kid. Yeah. I've been that kid who had to make friends from scratch yeah. many times. And when you're in that situation, then you're more mindful of that. And that's why I'm such an advocate of people being inclusive, including friends, making time for friends, because I know the power of how much it, feel, it makes you feel welcomed, especially when moving somewhere new or starting with some sort of new social group or venture. Yeah, because I remember we've been to a couple of conferences now and uh, one of the things I've noticed about you is that you're really good at identifying, just like in passing, someone who's on their own, doesn't seem to know anyone, and just going up to them saying, hey, you know, I'm Drew, these are some of my friends, say hi. And that's, that's a skill that I think a lot of people, A, don't know how to do, but they, they don't understand the value of that, not only for that person, but also for yourself as well. And there's so many, thank you for that, by the way, I appreciate it. There's so many layers to that. The first thing is that, if you think about a time that you walked into a party that you were excited to go to, but you didn't know anybody, yeah. or you went to a conference, or an event, or the first day of university, or school, or work, there was some part of you that felt like an outsider, yeah. and that you wanted to be included. Yeah. And the thing is that if those situations happen regularly, unfortunately there are people that use it as an excuse to say, I'm just not gonna meet new people, mm -hmm. or I have a hard time meeting new people. How many times have you heard from a friend, or someone you know, that I've moved to a new city and it's too hard to meet new people. Yeah. And so I just stick with the one or two friends that I have or don't make new friends. And then ultimately, if that continues, that can lead to a lot of worser things like chronic loneliness, which has all sorts of impact mm. on our health. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's something I know that you've got a personal interest in loneliness, but when you're growing up, say you have like a typical kind of high school um, uh, experience in America and stuff, did you notice any things that you think have stuck with you today in terms of like uh, your ability to, to you know, start new friendships and that kind of stuff? Um, and how's that changed throughout your adulthood? Yeah, I think in high school especially, when you're starting to figure out a little bit of who you are. Because for, just, just yeah. sorry to interrupt, but just from my uh, perspective of high school in America, and a lot of people listen to this probably from the UK, it just looks like the movies. It looks like, you know, there's a, there's a jock, there's a bully, you know, there's the cool kids, there's the, the nerds. Like, is it, is it literally like that? <laughs> there's some schools that are more like that. Yeah. There are some yeah. schools that are less like that. I think I went to a pretty typical school. Uh -huh. um, and I think the thing that I learned in high school is that the understanding the importance of intentional friendships, mm -hmm. right? And not just having a friend that, I mean, when you're young and you're starting getting to like partying or like hanging out late or maybe yeah. some people are having their first like relationship, part of it is you just trying to have experiences to figure out who you are and enjoy school and exactly. fit in in some degree. Mm -hmm. And then later on in high school, I think I started to understand that, wow, if you start to have intentional friendships, 
that can give you a jump start on learning so many different uh, aspects that can ultimately get formed into your career and your personal development. For instance, in high school, there was a group of my friends that were really interested in public speaking. Yeah. And so just together, we just ventured into that. Mm. There was a group of my friends that were into uh, web development. This was just early on when yeah. we were starting to build websites and start web development companies. Yeah. And that would end up being the initial training that led to my first company that I started in university, which was a web design firm. So I think, you know, like a lot of kids, I was just dealing with fitting in yeah. and having a girlfriend yeah. and not being left out. Yeah. My dad's side of the family especially, I have a solid group of cousins who, in a way, were my first set of friends. And one thing I realized is that it didn't matter if we were cleaning the kitchen, it didn't matter if we were cooking, because we would cook together, yeah. it didn't matter what we were doing, but if we were doing it together, we were having an amazing time. Yeah. And that's when I realized that your friendships and your relationships play a crucial role in the enjoyment of day-to-day -day life. And I think um, one thing that um, I wanted to, to touch on is that sense of purpose, that sense of community and family importance is kind of instilled in me coming a, a, a growing up in, in an Indian household. And it's something that I, I really cherish because I think a lot of people are lacking that. And it's not just an Indian thing, obviously, you know, Italian thing and sure. most of the culture share that. But it's something that was instilled in me very, very early on. And I, and I have that um, to be grateful for because I think that's allowed me to uh, understand um, the importance of having that sort of tribe around you. Well, let's talk about that for a second because there's something that those cultures that are family-centric understand or community-centric understand and hosting guests and all the things that go along with it, it's that for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, no one person could survive completely on their own. Yeah. So the question was always, if you don't have people that are there to support you, if you don't have people that are there that have your back, if you don't have their back, if you're not developing these altruistic tendencies of looking after them, welcoming them, especially over food, over yeah, a meal. That's yeah. why Indian families and many other families are very aggressive about, hey, <laughs> come over and eat. Yeah. It's the food that bonds you, yeah, right? Yeah, Sometimes it's a little too aggressive, but it's yeah. actually a really beautiful thing. Yeah. And so now we've gone through an interesting trend in society, through technology, through modernization, and a lot of beautiful things, where we once needed an entire village to survive, we actually don't need that same village to survive on a day-to-day -day basis in Western society. We're still relying on somebody to keep the power on yeah. in our studio and in our apartment, but that's not anybody that you have a relationship with. So, but even though you don't need people to survive, you still need people to thrive. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we're seeing that loneliness and isolation can have such a damaging effect on our health. In fact, uh, Vivek Murthy, um, the former uh, Surgeon General in the United States, he said that, um, quoted a bunch of literature and showed that Loneliness, chronic loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of its effect on our mortality. Mortality, wow, that's huge. And loneliness has been correlated with so many other things, anxiety, yeah. depression, yeah. other mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And this is why you're seeing sort of a resurgence in people longing for community and choosing community on purpose. Absolutely, and it, it's quite um, ironic, isn't it? In a hyper-connected community, in a hyper-connected world, loneliness is soaring. I want to get onto this. I just want to go back to the recipe, Rocky. Please. So, <laughs> so you've already heard, heard loads of spluttering and, and, and frying sounds. What I've done is I've taken the uh, sweet corn and pine nuts off the dry heat. I've put that into uh, a bowl here. And I've got um, uh, some chopped purple sprout and broccoli. I put it in uh, with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil on low heat. You, try, you want to try not to um, take it on high heat because when you use extra virgin olive oil, you'll burn it. If you do find it's burning, just take it off the heat and then it will cool down pretty rapidly if you're using a good quality pan. Um, this is only going to take three or four minutes. It's been about three or four minutes now. The, uh, the broccoli has gone like a vibrant dark green color. And you, you cook with your, your nose as well as your eyes as well as your, your, your um, uh, ears as well. So you want to sound, you want to listen to all these different things. Um, now the broccoli Sa sounds good. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're just going to go in with um, the sweet corn and the pine nuts back into the pan with the, um, uh, the broccoli here. 
and we're going to add the spinach so at every opportunity we are adding magnesium folate greens all these different sort of colors and what they represent phytonutrients the different sorts of health properties all these different things i mean this is a very simple salad it doesn't have to be anything fancy um, and to this uh, i'm going to add some cajun spices as well so this is a good quality mix you can find in most supermarkets it's got cayenne it's got fennel paprika um, some uh, some cumin as well um, that's just gonna bring together all those those wonderful different colors and like the marriage of beautiful flavor <laughs> um, and then uh, the lobster is going to sit up uh, on top of this but i'm going to uh, warm it up separately uh, before i put this in just putting the lid on is going to gently wilt the spinach it doesn't need any extra heat so i'm going to turn that off and uh, it's nearly done it's coming together and i'm going to make the dressing for you amazing so so tell me about the inspiration behind this recipe is it in your book it's it's actually your my inspiration man oh, nice. <laughs> so i wanted to make something a little bit more uh, american themed so yeah, california yeah, yeah. fresh produce that farm to table sort of yeah. you know the ice water is what she brought like Absolutely. decades ago and everyone's sort of catching up with now um, so everything here is uh, is local. It's uh, from uh, different farms around the UK, uh, and obviously because of the celebration, you're over here from LA, I'm throwing in some lobster. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, a lobster that's caught um, off the British Isles as well. So it's super fresh oh, and uh, gorgeous. Um, you know, every now and then I like to splurge out on something a little bit more. Um, a little bit more pricey uh, right with options for other people who want to try something different exactly exactly man and to make this um this dressing it's it's very simple so we're going to go in with a couple of scoops of the avocado uh, again california in the spot uh i know you guys love the avocado i mean i, I used to live in um sydney and uh, avocado is everywhere there as well so uh, it's yeah. yes we're, we're lucky to be able to get avocados over in the uk mm. um and uh uh, a little bit of the uh, peas here as well goes into that and then it's just a case of adding a little bit of water a good plug of extra virgin olive oil and just popping it in the neutral bullet and it just gives a nice like green as easy as that if you know if we all just understood how easy it is to make dressings because the dressings yeah they really bring together a dish Absolutely. In an incredible way. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, most of the dressings you're going to find in the supermarket right now, they're just filled with so much totally. junk. Yeah. I, um, I, have a, I have a section on my website where I, I do a little cooking course online, and um, one of the, the videos that's most popular is uh, how to make your, your just simple dressings, like super quick dressings. So, you know, lemon juice like I'm doing here, olive oil, uh, Dijon mustard, um, Things that you can whip up very, very quickly with minimal equipment. Mm -hmm. um, that's exactly how I like to just try and teach people how to eat. So, so after um, high school, you went to university. Yeah. And uh, what, that was the, the basis of your, your first company, you said? So yeah, I started, you know, I quickly, school was, I always did well in school. Mm. Uh, well, you need especially to having to, man. <laughs> immigrant parents, Indian parents. <laughs> But something shifted for me in uh, university where I just sort of, you know, everybody takes a different journey. Yeah. I got very clear on the fact that to achieve the dreams and goals that I had in life, which were really big, I wanted to take the path of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I was studying computer science at the time, and I'm literally thinking to myself, I'm never going to do computer science. Yeah. But I don't know what else to study. Yeah. So in university, I actually started a company because I knew that ultimately what I'll share in a few minutes, if I went to my parents and said that I wanted to go be an entrepreneur, I really had to show them that I was truly headed down the path yeah. and I had some success on that journey. I'm so you need to pause there for one second because yeah. this is gonna be really All loud. Right. <laughs> so yeah, you were saying. Yeah, so I set out the vision that I wanted to both attend school mm -hmm. and also start a company. Mm -hmm. So I started a company, a very simple company that was doing back-end development mm -hmm. for uh, local companies and then eventually I made my way to get introduced to some banks uh -huh. um, in the town that we were in, uh, Delaware, and got a few projects from some people who were willing to take a risk. Okay. So I'm both building projects for companies in school, charging them money, and also attending school at the same time. Wow. And got clear at that time that uh, something really important, that I think is an important lesson for everybody listening here, is the bigger your goals and dreams are in life, the more you truly need friends that have your back. Mm. So I started surrounding myself with people in university 
that were also trying to build something, that were trying to grow, that were trying to develop. It's great to have friends that you go party with, that you go do this with, yeah. that with, yeah. but who are the friends that intentionally want to make themselves better mm. and can support me uh, when I don't know exactly which direction I want to go in? Yeah. So I started this company in school, and after a couple years of doing that, I went to my parents with uh, something they never thought that their son would come to them with, which was, uh, hey, I have this company, you know it's been doing okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to take a year off school and go pursue this. And how was that? Uh, uh, let's just say that <laughs> it was a six month constant conversation. Right. Ultimately though, my parents knew I was a good kid, never got in trouble, mm -hmm. always did well in school and said, listen, if this is your journey, yeah. the worst that happens is it doesn't work out and you just go back to school. Okay, well that, that's very understanding for them. Very understanding. A lot of immigrant parents would be like, oh, what on earth are you talking about? Exactly. Back to studies. Yeah. And uh, so they let me do my thing. And uh, I hired my two best friends. Yeah. Uh, one of them actually dropped out of school. <laughs> His mom made him go back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I probably made him go back too because I wouldn't have uh, been able to live with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. if I was I the one that convinced, himself. convinced yeah, him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we did that for a few years. And I'll tell you what, something that I'm important that I learned mm -hmm. is that uh, Working on something that you love, especially if you can do it with people that you care about. Yeah. Uh, working on something intentional that you can, that you love, that you can grow with, that you can um, enjoy. Mm -hmm. There's uh, even though it wasn't the most financially lucrative, we were making about the same amount of money that I would have in my first, you know, job being right. out of school yeah. mm -hmm. as a computer programmer. Mm -hmm. It there was such a deep meaning. Yeah. There was such a deep meaning and such so much enjoyment that came along with it, and a lot of growth that came along with it. Yeah, yeah. So that was when you kind of realized that you were a natural born entrepreneur, right? Because I, I, I'm trying to think back to when I was like 18, 19 in the university, there's no way I would have been leaving uh, university. I wouldn't have had that drive, I wouldn't have had that sort of, or the idea of the concept to just go it alone. Yeah. You find it inside yourself and you really have to think about, well, what's, what's the driver and what's the goal? And for me, because relationships have always been centered in my life, I realized that what would make me happy was working with people that I cared about. And what would make me miserable is having my dream job, but not loving anybody or really, you know, feeling like I was working with people who understood me and got me. Yeah. Everybody's different. And you have to reverse engineer your life appropriately. Yeah. So I knew what was going to make me happy was having the opportunity to work with friends and family. And right now, you know, I own multiple companies. I've built many companies since. I've sold companies, started different companies. Uh, Work with both my sisters in my company. Yeah. You've met my sisters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, my dad recently retired last year, and I told him, you know, you can't fully retire because he's not the type. Yeah, yeah. So at the end of the year, I'm going to hire you for this new company. I'm going to <laughs> he says, let's great. do it. That's amazing. So it's all about figuring out what makes you happy. Yeah. And one of the things I got clear on very early on mm -hmm. is that relationships and friendships make me happy. Yeah. And if there's one little note that I throw in here before you go back to the recipe, mm -hmm. is that Actually, I think a lot of people in their later years in life realize this too. In fact, there's this great book, it's called The Five Regrets of the Dying. Uh -huh. It's written by a nurse from Australia who interviewed people who were on their deathbed in hospice yeah. and categorized and started documenting their regrets. Mm -hmm. And one of the top regrets that was on the five mm -hmm. was, I wish I spent time with or kept in touch with golden friendships that I lost amongst the years because that's where I got so much joy. Yeah. I just figured that out a little bit earlier, so I, I engineered my entire life around that for myself. I remember actually one of the first trips I made out to LA, and you were like, look man, all I want to do is work with people that I care with most, my friends, my family, if I can surround myself and engineer a lifestyle where I can I can do that, then I'm happy. It doesn't matter about you know the bank account, it doesn't matter about all the extra, you know, the add-ons to our life, it, it's about that. And, for me it is, and yeah. somebody might be different, yeah. right? But I think the thing is, until you ask yourself, what is really, what really gives you that happiness? What gives you that joy? Mm. I think you'll find on a daily basis, there aren't many things, uh, of course, meaningful work, right? I always want to solve problems that are important. I love to do work in the space of health. We have a lot of great initiatives that we're doing in the United States around health, lifestyle medicine, functional medicine. So that's always important because you want to make a difference and give back. Mm but there aren't many things that have an impact on your average daily level of happiness mm. as much as our relationships do. And we have the data to prove it. Yeah. You know, there's a really great study that was done off of the Framingham data. Yeah. We talked a little bit about this, yeah. but there's another study that's out there and it talked about happiness 
and social networks and is happiness contagious? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I looked at this, uh, Framingham data was from this data from 1970 to the early 2000s, and they mapped the social connections. Uh, this researcher mapped the social connections between individuals and found that that happiness was literally contagious when somebody had a good week and their happiness index score on their uh, survey uh, was showing high, mm. their friends and their network up to three degrees of separation felt the impact of their good mood. Yeah. And this is why it's so important to surround ourselves with people that lift us up and can help us uh, address and solve the challenges in life in a meaningful and uplifting way. Absolutely, and I think that's why you know it's really important to share food around a table, oh, just like so this. <laughs> so, just to recap, um, everything's been put together now. I reheated um, the lobster and a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, um, some uh, a little bit of seasoning, and then we've dressed it with that really quick. I mean, you saw how quick. Oh, super quick. So, <laughs> just that. Um, uh, a lemon, avocado, pea, and olive oil dressing. Um, hopefully that will give it a bit of zing. It's probably under-seasoned, because I always like to under-season because people's seasoning tastes a little bit different. Sure. But give it a try, man, and uh, let the listeners know what you think. Yes, you absolutely. Can, you can be honest. Don't by the way, for anybody listening but not watching, <laughs> definitely watch, but also really amazing is that in America, I don't know what it's like in the, in, in the UK, but last year was the first year that spending money on eating out mm. exceeded the amount of money that people spend on groceries. So people oh, are yeah. cooking less. Yeah. They're yeah. watching more cooking shows and yeah, they're cooking yeah. less. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of times for younger people especially, the complaint is, I don't have a kitchen, or I don't have a big kitchen, if you live in New York, LA, other places. Yeah. And here the setup is, you literally have a burner. Yeah. Right? You have one burner, yeah. <laughs> little small area, yeah. you know, four square feet that you're yeah. making this entire meal on, yeah. so you don't need a lot of space to make an incredible meal. Exactly, yeah. It's one of the things actually we're, um, we're doing with culinary medicine. Um, we're, one of the modules we're teaching at uh, the Bristol Medical University since so UCL is um, food poverty and why, you know, if you do have a patient who's living off the food bank, what kind of things can you tell them to eat? There's beans, there's tinned sardines, there's all these different things. You can make the most out of the most basic things, even if you only have like, you know, a single burner, uh, for example. So, yeah. Food is amazing. Good. I'm glad. Delicious recipe. I'm glad. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of layers and textures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the softness of the corn and, and the broccoli and, and the dressing. Tell us again, what was the ingredients? Uh, lemon, avocado, pea, extra virgin olive oil, and a little bit of water. Super simple, yeah. delicious. Cool, I'm glad, yeah, I'm, I'm glad, man. man. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're watching this and you want to listen to the rest of the conversation, we're going to carry on on the podcast. The link for that is going to be down below. Uh, and uh, we'll catch you next time in the doctor's kitchen with a new guest.